हेलो वेलकम टू माय चैनल एंड आई एम आदित्य सांगोरे कॉमन सिटीजन जस्ट लाइक यू एंड आई हैव विथ मी टुडे मिस्टर डेविड क्रो ही इज अ इंडिपेंडेंट रिसर्चर एंड अ साइंटिफिक क्रिटिक एंड रन अ पॉडकास्ट कॉल्ड called the scientific called the infectious myth and uh, i have been following his podcast since about a month and uh, i have got a very new perspective on the covid-19 pandemic and uh, uh, to tell you that uh, i have some doubts uh, i cannot trust the government right now i have some doubts on the government and the uh, uh, medical organizations that provide uh, us the different guidelines so uh, it is my honor to introduce to you our guest uh, mr uh, david crow uh, namaste from india sir and uh, namaste i'm very pleased to be here yeah how are you doing sir i'm i'm excellent thank you so sir how is canada doing how is canada dealing with the pandemic um not as strict as in some places uh i have never been told that i can't leave my home okay uh but almost all businesses have been closed and just today they're opening up restaurants places to get your hair cut uh things like that so uh some things are coming back to normal it's still very difficult to fly um mm-hmm. uh there are still a lot of businesses like uh gyms uh massage uh things like that that are still closed and there's no word on when they will be able to um, open so the damage to the economy continues but it's not nearly as bad as say spain or italy or even parts of the united states yes sir uh if you sir if you look at the indian picture right now uh, we had one of the most strongest lockdown in history so because uh, according to the epidemic act of 1890 uh, all our rights are dissolved uh, and citizens cannot move freely in the country during the pandemic they, and they cannot even protest because uh, you will be uh, you will be uh, jailed because uh, you are spreading the virus so uh, if you go, if you were to go outside if you were to be in india police uh, were directly uh, beating you or arresting you uh, for uh, roaming around but right now the situation ha- has been better because uh, they have uh, they have lifted some restrictions but uh, they are like uh, dividing uh, areas in zones like red zone is the worst affected zone and the green zone is the least affected and orange is in the between so we don't really have a complete freedom but uh, people are uh, still in a, a lot of panic they are extensively wearing masks and uh, wearing pp kits and uh, about 30% of uh, people Uh, are unemployed in india currently so the situation is very bad because we have uh, uh, more than 140 million uh, daily wage workers in india so those people are uh, you know traveling back to their states and uh, i don't know when they will come back so the problem in india is very great than in europe and other countries uh, yes and how how have the number of deaths been Uh, so actually the uh, number of deaths in india uh, is very less it's uh, around 4000 deaths and this is a quite a surprise for me because if you see uh, in uh, we have a large population and the density is also very mm. large yeah uh, but uh, as compared to other countries uh, like united states uh, uh, 4000 is like nothing for us like so yeah i think in the united states it's over 100000 now although those numbers are highly unreliable they're not real numbers yeah no, nobody has real numbers all the statistics you hear about um about covid or most of the statistics are significantly biased in in one way or another if not totally fraudulent yes yes sir uh, i i had also highly doubts on the numbers uh, and uh, i think uh, those numbers of the death number get gets increased because uh, the guidelines given by cdc and uh, other organizations uh, to the hospitals but actually in india i don't think they they are directly giving guidelines our uh, medical organizations like icm or indian council of medical research are providing any guidelines for diagnosis or, or writing on death certificate but currently uh, we uh, just uh, I, i think 10 days back uh, they or 5 days back they have given some guidelines that if any person has pneumonia blood clotting uh, or uh, uh, death due to respiratory failure 
uh, acute respiratory syndrome etc will be counted as covid deaths so with a, without a test uh, no uh, with a test but he must be positive and also should uh, be uh, dead uh, uh, sh- should have died with uh, those symptoms like with shortness those of breath symptoms yeah, so so that's not as bad in the united states <clears throat> they admitted that several people who'd been killed by a gun have been counted as covid deaths yeah and the government said it, uh, although it took only a short amount of time to add them to the statistics it could take a year to take them out of the statistics okay by that which time hopefully too late yes sir yes sir definitely so like i'll ask you questions like uh, uh, a yeah. like a common citizens ask asks a question because when i go out and uh, debate with my fellow uh, colleagues i have uh, i have to debate them and they provide me such they say that uh, the uh, the us death numbers they might be uh, lagging somewhere but they'll recover and uh, they'll post the real numbers but uh, whenever i uh, whenever i tell them something they say i mean you are doing a conspiracy theory and uh, if i upload some uh, pictures of the death numbers uh, automatic fact, fact checkers uh, come on my post and say there is a lag in the death rate but uh, this doesn't mean the virus is less dangerous um there's an organization in the united states called the national vital statistics uh, something society or something like that yes sir. and and they are in charge of um uh how to record death rates and when they came out with a new code for covid they they said that um it should be recorded as a covid death if it is a if it is the cause of death or a significant factor and as you probably are aware most of the people who are dying mm. are elderly yes um and they have many health problems uh in italy 60% of the people who died had three or more serious health problems before covid came along yes sir uh but those people are all if they're co- if they're coronavirus positive they're all recorded as covid deaths Yes. and and actually a senior uh scientific advisor to the Italian Ministry of Health said that they believe uh that only 12% of the people who were recorded as covid deaths actually died from covid so they've multiplied the numbers by a factor of 7 and and i think the same thing has occurred in other countries in england you're allowed to record a death as covid without a test Okay. Um in Belgium uh everybody who dies in a retirement home yes is is recorded as a covid death even okay. if they've never been tested. Yeah. In um in New York City in one retirement home 55 people died and they were all recorded as covid deaths and not a single person had been tested. So there's a massive inflation of the numbers. and you know i don't know what the 100,000 means it could be could be 10,000 deaths it could be 50,000 deaths it could be 100,000 but i very much doubt that it's more than 100,000 yeah yeah i have also read about the 12% uh, italy uh, mortality and uh, uh, actual actually in india if you uh, if you get covid or if you have some symptoms you are uh, told to uh, do the pcr testing which is which they say is the most accurate rt pcr testing is the most accurate test and uh, what uh, because uh, a lot of people in india are uh, do not have the right information and they do, do not dig up uh, the information because they are blindly trusting the medical authorities and they think think that the medical authorities want their best and they think that the pcr test is a very reliable uh, very reliable test and uh, if the rna of the virus found in china match the rna of the virus in the person then they are thinking that it is 100% positive and uh, the uh, even p- i have i have seen even p- uh, the the number of people in the hospitals have increased in india actually because they are taking asymptomatic people inside the hospital for isolation a lot of asymptomatic right. people who have asthma or any other kind of uh, problem so uh, for my viewers can you please uh, in simple uh, terms explain uh, how the pcr testing works and the problem with the number of cycles because different organizations are recommending different cycles right there are many uh, problems with the pcr test so first of all they identified a chain of rna 
uh, that they claim is about 30,000 bases long. And uh, so they start the process by taking, say, a nasal swab or a throat swab, and um, they then extract RNA, not necessarily the RNA of the virus. They extract all RNA. And they also have to eliminate uh, DNA and other interfering substances. That's step number one. Mm. That is not a perfect step. You don't get all the RNA out of that process. The second step is that you then have to convert the RNA to DNA because PCR only works on DNA. And according to the world expert on RT-PCR, Stephen Buston, who I interviewed about a month ago, uh, this process is at best 50% efficient. So you only get about um, half of the RNA converted into DNA. And he said that the efficiency varies by about a factor of 10. So okay. you might get 5% or 50%. Yes. So by the time you finish the first two steps, the amount of DNA that you have bears no relation to the amount of RNA that you started with. Okay. You then run the PCR, which is a cyclical uh, uh, process. So you, you run it once and you double the amount of DNA. You run it again and you double it. And as you, you mentioned the cycle number, at a certain number you stop. If yes. you have generated enough light, not yeah. DNA, enough light, then you are considered to be positive. And if you haven't, okay. you're considered to be negative. Yes. So this is believed to be the quantity of virus. But as I pointed out, you, you don't start with a quantity of DNA that is related to the quantity mm. of RNA you started with. Yes. So the cycle number in different labs, even with different people, will mean different things. But they choose a single number, 37, 45, and they run it for that many cycles. We know this is a problem. Uh, for example, in Singapore, they had 18 people for which they ran tests every day. They were all in the hospital. They were all COVID patients. And in Singapore, they were using 37 cycles. Okay. And 11 out of the 18 people went from positive to negative to positive again inside okay. the hospital. Okay. If positive means infected and negative means uninfected, then this means that people became cured and then they got infected while in the hospital with yeah. the most stringent infection control procedures. Yes. So it's hard, it's impossible to believe that. The, the more logical thing to believe is that the test is producing false positives. Yeah. Um, now I mentioned fluorescence. Every time you double the amount of DNA in the test, you, you free up some fluorescent molecules and they produce light. Yeah. And so to each cycle, you shine a light into your test tube mm -hmm. and it reflects, uh, it fluoresces at a different frequency. And you measure okay. the amount of light and you say, this means how much DNA we have. You're not yeah. measuring DNA directly. Mm. If anything goes wrong in your test and some of the fluorescent molecules are liberated without, uh, in, a, in a separate process, then you will have a false positive because you will be measuring light that does not reflect the presence of DNA. Okay. There are just numerous problems. Um, this person I mentioned, Stephen Buston, recommended that yeah. you not run PCR more than 35 cycles yeah. because of the problems this produces. But in the United States, out of 33 tests approved by the FDA, the United States regulator, only three out of 33 used less than 35 cycles. Okay. So the others were running the PCR uh, test too many cycles and creating the risk of false positives. Mm. And the reason for this is because medical officials are scared of missing uh, people who are infected. Yes. But the, the cost of doing that is that you generate artificial numbers of false positives. And a paper from China estimated that if you test people with no symptoms, 80% of the positive tests would be false positives. Ooh. So that could mean that the, that the huge number of people testing positive in many countries is, is maybe only one 
tenth or one uh, one fifth of what's actually being reported. And of course, the epidemic is uh, the fear of the epidemic is due to the large numbers. So if yes. the large numbers are false, we don't really have an epidemic. Yeah, absolutely, sir. And uh, one more problem. Uh, uh, one one of my I was talking to one of my friends. Uh, he uh, he is a microbiology graduate, and uh, he never mentioned sources. But he he was saying that when Carrie Mullis said that this test uh, should not should not be used for diagnosis. Uh, I, I told him this argument, but uh, he, he's saying that there are significant developments in the test through all these years, even after Carrie Mulli. So are there any significant developments that increase the accuracy of the test throughout the years? Uh, I, I don't know of any that increase the accuracy. Um, Stephen Buston created, a, with, with some colleagues, created a list of uh, recommendations for more accurate use of uh, RT-PCR a few years ago, and uh, he's said that most people ignore these guidelines. Mm. They just go ahead anyway. So there, there have been technological developments, but a lot of them have been around the automation of, of the test. Yeah. Th this use of light to measure the amount of DNA was actually invented by Kerry Mullis mm. in the 1990s. Um, so I think the major advances in PCR were done in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, there, are, there definitely are some minor advances, but most of them are related to the ease of use of the test. Okay. Yes. And, and so a, a, a RT-PCR machine in 2020 is a much easier device to use. And I asked Stephen Buston ag again, I said, do people get more confidence in this because the machine is so easy to use and because you just press a button, the machine runs, it produces a result and therefore you believe it. And he said, yes, that, that is a problem. The, yeah. the machine is so easy to use that people believe it's, it's flawless. Yeah. But it's not just the data from Singapore. There are several other papers that show, many other papers that show results that are impossible to believe. So if a machine is producing results that are obviously wrong, it may be producing results that are wrong that are not so obvious. So yes. in, in other words, if, if you have somebody who goes to the hospital with symptoms and then uh, uh, they get better and they test negative and they leave the hospital and they test positive again and they go back to the hospital for a few days because yes. uh, they're forced to mm. and then they test negative again and then a few days later, they test positive. And then they go back to the hospital again. And a few days later, they test negative. You, you would say there's probably a problem with this, with yeah. this test. Yes. Um, yet the people who documented this case of the man who, who went to the hospital three times mm. never said, maybe this is a case of false positives. Mm. So there's a great deal of interpretation that is very convenient. The idea is to interpret the test results so that you don't question the viral theory mm. and you don't question the validity of PCR. Yes. And, and this is not science. A mm. scientist should say, if you went to the hospital and tested positive and then negative and then positive again, mm. possibly the test is wrong. Yeah. That, that's a possibility. And possibly this person got reinfected. Possibly yes. it's dead virus. You can come up with like three or four or six hypotheses and then a scientist would test them. But yeah. in this case, what they say is, this is the answer. There's no data. And then they continue as if they'd answered the question. Yeah. But they, they have not answered the question in a scientific way. Yes. So uh, one of the great things uh, you said during an uh, interview with uh, Dr. Kaufman is that uh, you said that uh, experts are allowed to say anything without any sources and uh, people like you who are actual, who are the actual experts who give sources uh, are always, always, uh, you know, uh, told to quote sources. But these experts in India, actually experts come out and they quote literally no sources and India is blindly mm -hmm. following WHO's guidelines. So, yeah, so sir, what, what, will, uh, what, what recommendations will you give to a normal person who wants to do independent research like you? 
of fact well book. um i i think you have to realize that a lot of what you're being told by experts yeah is wrong yeah the, the experts have heard from other experts who've heard from the world health organization or the cdc yes. um take masks for example mm. you know i've i've looked into whether masks work and the science seems to say masks don't work and in mm. fact even the world health organization said the general public should not wear masks but when i challenge people they they send me a paper that is a mathematical model mm. mathematical models are not science if if you if a if a mathematician puts in their beliefs about mm. what happens and and creates an equation and then they they run their the computer and they produce results Th that doesn't prove that the results are meaningful yeah you need experimental e evidence um I, i think a good example of a mathematical model that works is an aircraft simulator mm. but people didn't just create an aircraft simulator they would validate it against the actual behavior of an airplane because you had a method to validate the mathematical model an uh, aircraft simulator now is a very very close simulation of what it's really like to be in the cockpit okay. but that's only because they had the way to validate it mm. if you have a mathematical model for masks and yes. you've never validated that model yeah or if the science which could be used to validate it says that it doesn't work mm. then your mathematical model is useless yes sir the same thing happened with mathematical models for the number of cases Mm. All the mathematical models were extremely pessimistic by a factor of 10, 100 or even 1000. Yes, yes. And yet we still believe these mathematical models. The mathematical models for coronavirus are total garbage. Yeah. And uh, the only way to validate the models is to accept them and then see what happens and realize mm. that the model was wrong, which is where we are now. Yes. We closed down Canada, we closed down the United States, we closed down India, Italy, Spain, all these different places were closed down on the basis of a mathematical model. Uh people who who do not have a vested interest now realize the mathematical models were wrong, but now it's too late. Yes. We've destroyed large parts of our economy. We've destroyed people's lives. People have committed suicide. Um people have died for a variety of reasons related to the lockdowns and we cannot bring those people back. Yes, absolutely. And the people who did this to us will never admit that they were wrong. Yeah. Sir, uh coming to the second part of this conversation, if you have to uh for a com uh, I'm giving you some uh, you know common sense analogy that if you have to you know check if a new pandemic has arrived then uh, i think basically we will see two things if there is uh, any excess mortality uh, in people and if the cox postulate for the virus has been satisfied so sir what, what are your views on the excess mortality have you seen any excess mortality during this uh, period of march till uh, may or maybe february till may because uh, a normal person cannot see uh, because he only sees data from news channels or google and he uh, he thinks that the number of cases are increasing 20 24000 people are dead in italy 70000 people are dead in us so he gets scared but uh, how can a person uh, independently himself find out about the excess mortality of the vir uh, virus or the pandemic um uh somebody just posted an, an analysis of graphs of mortality so yeah. first of all um there was at first there was no excess mortality uh but then there was a steep increase in mortality and what this person showed was that the mortality increase only occurred after the lockdown okay and i think a reason for this uh, is something i'm getting very interested in is one of the first things that happened is that people in retirement homes were told that they could not have visitors Mm. So family members or friends could not visit these old people. Uh a lot of these old people were then either intubated mm. which in old people has a death rate that's almost 100%. Yeah. Or they were heavily sedated. And somebody who has respiratory problems who is heavily sedated will likely die. Mm. So it is it almost like euthanasia. Euthanasia. Yes. 
it's not a deliberate killing of people, but uh, they felt that there wasn't anything they could do for these people. They felt that because they were coronavirus positive, they were, they were going to experience severe symptoms. And to put them out of their misery, they put them on high doses of morphine, uh, antipsychotics, and, and mm. other drugs like that. Yeah. And I'm discovering documents that explicitly state this. In Spain, uh, a, a society for palliative care, care for people at the end of their lives, mm said that, that if this person cannot be put into the ICU, and normally putting somebody in the ICU would mean intubation, then they should be put on um, a heavy dose of morphine, Haldol, and perhaps Mizadolam, mm. uh, which is another, uh, they're all basically sedatives. Mm. So what you will do is you will basically put this person into a coma, mm they have respiratory problems and gradually their body will just cease to function. Yeah. And I think that the massive increase in deaths was, it was largely in older people. Mm. And I think because there were no visitors, there were no sons and daughters to yeah. look at this old person and say, yesterday, this person sat up in bed and had a little bit of a conversation before they got tired and went to sleep mm. today. They are lying on the bed, looking at the ceiling, and, and they don't even recognize me. Yeah. What happened? Yes. So if there were visitors, the doctors would not be able to get away with the heavy sedation of the patients. Once the visitors were removed, uh, the doctors could sedate everybody who they saw as a problem. Yeah. Uh, so I, so uh -huh. I think that the okay. mortality rate, in summary, I think that the mortality increase is real, but I don't believe it's caused by the virus. And there are yes. many other reasons for the mortality apart from the sedation of old people as well. Yeah. So uh, I saw uh, one, uh, one video and uh, it, it showed that if uh, the video uh, concluded that if you're near the Western world, uh, you are more likely to, you know, uh, that spike in the death rate is more likely to happen from COVID-19. So, because if you see India, there, there are only 4,000 uh, cases because India is a massive, huge country and the viruses, virus can travel like crazy, according to their theory. But uh, if you see that only the Western world is heavily affected uh, because South Korea uh, has less deaths, Japan has less deaths who have not even done a lockdown, proper lockdown, just advise social distancing. So, uh, why do you think that the Western world has increasing number of cases? Um, I can't answer the entire uh, question, yeah. but there is a massive amount of testing. Yeah. And, and of course you can't die. Well, I guess you can be recorded as a coronavirus death, even if you're not tested, hmm. but generally you will be treated differently if you test positive. Hmm. So if you test positive with a fever, your treatment in the hospital will be different than if you test negative. Yes. And uh, so I think that the Western world believes fervently in these tests and i think that the treatment in the west is mm. much more aggressive because mm. the west has more money for the healthcare system yes we saw the same thing with sars i graphed the gross domestic product of the countries most affected by sars mm. and the death rate and there was mm. a very high correlation the higher the gdp the higher the death rate so yeah. canada had the highest death rate Yes. And China had the lowest. Mm. Why is this? Yeah. Canada has a better healthcare system. The yeah. reason was that Canada was using doses of the drug that, that could have been 10 or 20 times higher than in China yeah. Uh, yeah. Of, of a particular drug that was popular with SARS. Yes. So I, I think uh, there's more drugs being used. There was more intubation. There was more testing. And I, I think that the West generated... Uh, this problem mm. through their much stronger belief in the Western healthcare system. Yeah. So, sir, uh, mainly people uh, panicked because of the videos that were coming out of Italy's hospitals. And uh, I, I also uh, got one uh, paper and I saw that these hospitals are uh, nearly uh, 85 to 90 percent full in the winter months and uh, of it, uh, in Italy. Uh, and uh, was there any uh, significant increase in the mortality rate in Italy 
specifically because those Italian videos and those Chinese uh, doctors who were dragging people uh, in the streets were released. So that is why Indian people and people from all over the world got super panicked because this is some some new disease that has come and we have to shelter ourselves. Yeah, yeah. There is a type of bias where if you're told to look at something, you start seeing it. I yeah. mean, it's obvious. Mm. So who knows how many people die in Italy um, on a weekly basis? Yeah. Most people would guess wrong. Mm. But in a, in, a, in a bad flu season, uh, mm. I calculated that about 17,000 Italians would die. Mostly old people, mostly sick people. Yeah. Uh, this is totally normal. So for mm. a long time, there was no increase in deaths. Mm. But after the lockdown, there, there was an increase in, in deaths. Um, but I, I think because the lockdown is an artificial thing, you have to say that the increase in deaths must be artificial. The yeah. virus didn't start to become more dangerous after people were locked down. I mean, if, yeah. if that was the case, then they never should have locked down. Yeah. But I think um, factors uh, like increasing panic in the hospitals, um, s heavy sedation in the nursing homes, Mm. Uh, Italy lost a lot of workers in the nursing mm. homes. A lot of mm. the workers came from other parts of Europe, yeah. poorer parts of Europe. And as soon as Italy was seen as experiencing an epidemic, those people got on buses and went home. Yeah. So the nursing homes were severely understaffed. Mm. And, and I just read a, an article by an American doctor who works with old people. And he yeah. said that there were basically people being left in beds in nursing homes and not even being given the basic care. Yeah. They, they were not being helped to drink water. They were, they were not being helped to eat. And of course, uh, many of these people can't feed themselves or they can't drink by themselves. So they need help. And yeah. if they're understaffed, some of those people are just left to die. Um, oh. That's very unfortunate. And, and, uh, and maybe in India, there's more of a family connection, right? Like I think in Asian countries, uh, families look after old people more than sending them to an institution. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, grandparents actually stay with the family only and they receive care from the you know, sons and the daughters. And uh, talking about the, um, you know, excess mortality rates, uh, are there any excess mortality in Sweden and Japan? Because it will be a very great example to calculate the excess mortality because they have no lockdown and we don't have to control for variables like accidents and other things that happen because of lockdown. So, Yeah, I haven't, I haven't analyzed uh, the Swedish statistics. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it is, um, it, people are trying to read a lot into Sweden. Sweden didn't have a lockdown, but people tended to lock themselves down. So for yes. example, the amount of public transportation usage in Sweden dropped a lot, um, mm. even though people were not forced to stay at home. Yeah. Uh, a lot fewer people used public transportation. Yeah. Um, I don't know if nursing homes in Sweden uh, forbid visitors, they might have. Yes. Yeah. So there were elements of the lockdown even in, in, um, in Sweden. The death rate was somewhat between, uh, it was under the United Kingdom, Italy, and Spain, but it was higher than the neighboring countries of Norway and uh, I think Finland, which did have a lockdown. Yeah. So it's, it's hard to read exactly what the differences were. There's many variables and there's only a single set of numbers. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. So it is hard to, to say. Yes, sir. And sir, uh, coming to the Koch postulate part uh, of the virus, uh, uh, we will try to uh, question the existence of the virus itself because they, uh, there is no single paper that says that uh, Koch's postulate are satisfied. And when I, uh, po when I post this argument with other people, uh, who they, they say that Koch's postulate will be satisfied later on. Maybe this, this is an emergency situation and uh, researchers are, are now busy right now and uh, they, will, uh, they will do the experiments later on, but it does not say that the virus doesn't exist. Uh, so what will you say about the Koch's postulate part and what have you read well, regarding this? First of all, there are a couple of papers that claim falsely that mm. Cox postulates have been satisfied. Yeah. Um, 
the virologists talk a lot about isolation, but what they mean by isolation is that you take impure materials, such mm -hmm. as a nasal swab, and you add those materials to a cell culture with mm -hmm. antibiotics, yeah. with other chemicals, and you look to see if any cells die. Mm -hmm. And if any cells die, you claim you have isolated the virus. Yeah. You can't see the virus. You have no way of knowing that it's really there, but mm. some cells died. They could have died because of the antibiotics. They could have died because of something else in your, in yeah. your uh, respiratory secretions. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the argument that we need to do this later, that we're, it's an emergency, mm. is utterly ridiculous. Mm. Because if you don't know that a virus exists, you are creating an imaginary pandemic. And mm. we do not know that the virus exists. Yeah. If the virus exists, there should be particles made up of proteins that mm. are wrapped around the 30,000 base RNA genome. Yeah. That, that's unquestionable. Those yeah. should exist. Yeah, if yeah. they exist, you should be able to find them. Yes. In fact, you don't know what the RNA is inside mm. the virus particles if you don't purify them. Yes. So Cox postulates is not just an academic exercise. Does yes, the virus yes. exist? Yeah. You cannot say that the RNA is from a virus unless you've proven it's from a virus. Correct. And nowadays you can take RNA out of a sample using various probes. Yeah. And uh, you can claim that the, the RNA is viral, but you have mm. not actually proven it. Yeah. Sir, uh, coming uh, to the exosomes theory, which uh, which is which has been made popular by Dr. Kaufman, and uh, is there any papers that uh, claim that uh, exosomes uh, are actually uh, similar to viruses? Uh, there is a lot of uh, exosomes are a mainstream scientific accepted. Mm. I mean, everybody accepts that exosomes exist. Yeah, everybody accepts that exosomes are virtually indistinguishable from viruses. Yeah. So there's really no question about this. There are numerous mainstream scientific papers. It's mm. not just people like Andy Kaufman who, who are saying that this virus doesn't exist, yeah. who are claiming that exosomes exist. Yeah. There's really no way to tell the difference between an exosome and a virus unless you purify and then follow Cox postulates. Once yeah. you've purified the virus, you could then expose an animal to the virus and produce disease. Yeah. You could not do that with an exosome. An exosome yes. would not be infectious. Yeah. So that would be the way to tell the difference between a virus and an exosome. And it would also be a way to prove that the virus causes disease. Yes. What if there was a virus, but it didn't cause disease? Yeah. And so we're reacting to the existence of a virus that is harmless. Yeah, that is yeah. another possibility. Yeah. Given that there are many, many people, probably the majority of people, who have positive RNA tests and have no symptoms, you could say that the virus is totally harmless and the people mm. who are sick are sick for another reason. Yes. And that we've created an, an epidemic based on a false belief that the okay. virus is pathogenic. Yes, sir. And uh, what happens with this uh, isolation argument is that sometimes uh, people say that this virus actually exists because uh, my family members, all of them have uh, gotten the same illness uh, together or maybe an area together or a community has got some illness. So they say that this is uh, some kind of virus that has been affected uh, community or, and it is COVID-19 because this is the new hot topic right now, COVID-19. So they'll definitely say... Well, I think in many people, in many cases, people claim to have had COVID. Yeah. Um, but let me give you a couple of examples. One of the first mm. papers on the coronavirus was of, of a family of six people mm. who traveled from one part of China to Wuhan, uh, visited some relatives, and then came back. So the, the, the adults in the family, four out of the six were adults. Mm. They were grandparents, yes. parents, children. The four older people all had similar symptoms. The, uh, the mother, who was central to the belief that this was infectious, was tested 18 times. 
and mm. she was negative every time. Mm. So there is an example where you have a family where everybody has similar symptoms or the overlapping symptoms. Yeah. Uh, she was one of the first to get sick. They assumed that her sickness was the same as everybody else's, but she tested negative. Okay. A Chinese paper just came out where there was a heart patient at a hospital mm. and they didn't think that she was a coronavirus patient. Mm. But after several weeks in the hospital, they tested her and she was positive. She had been in contact with 455 people, okay. uh, other patients in the hospital, medical staff and family members. Yes. Because she was not believed to be coronavirus, there were no restrictions on visitors. Yes. Uh, once she was discovered to be coronavirus positive, obviously she was put into isolation. Yes. They found all 455 contacts yes. and they tested them all and they were all negative. Yeah. So if this is an infectious virus, how is it possible that she was in contact with 455 people and not a single one of them mm. became infected? Yes, that, that is unbelievable. Yeah. There was a similar case in the United States where there was a couple, an elderly couple who both tested positive. And in that case, there were about 350 contacts. Yes. And they followed up with just about all the contacts. There yeah. were a few they could not track down. Yeah. Uh, but they followed up with over 300. And yeah. they tested them all. And all of them were negative. Yes, yes. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, so can can we imply from this uh, exosomes theory and this PCR that the people who are uh, symptomatic from any other kind of illnesses, their body because of reactions to maybe antibiotics or any other because of the disease itself, uh, their body, their immune system is releasing exosomes and the RNA sequence which has shown to be very similar to uh, exosomes is actually uh, test the PCR test is actually detecting that sequence and it is giving false positives. Um, I, I don't think we have to believe that the RNA comes from exosomes. Okay. The, the RNA could come from any part of our body. Yeah. It could even come from common bacteria. Yeah. We, we have no idea where it's coming from. Yeah. And the only thing that we, we know is that it has not been proven that it's, that it's viral. Yes. And you were, you, you know, you were talking about the people who got sick. I think yeah. it's very yeah. important to realize that the people who have a positive coronavirus test are treated mm. differently. Yeah. They're, they're treated with fear. They're mm. isolated. They're intubated. Yeah. They're put on uh, a lot of drugs that would not normally be used. Yes. So these people are essentially assaulted mm. by the medical system. Yes. And I, I think a lot of the higher death rate, maybe the entire higher death rate, is because of how we treat people that we fear because we yes. fear that they are infected. Yes, sir. I, I've been observing uh, WHO's recommending experimental drugs like hydrochloroquine, remdesivir, Tamiflu, etc. to these patients. And th those some, and I have heard calls of patients, asymptomatic patients who are, giving, who are given uh, antibiotics and paracetamol uh, for their treatment just for prevention. So this mm -hmm. is yeah, very strange. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there is a lot of that in that in one case I told you about uh, the Chinese man who, yeah. who had to go back to hospital three times. The second yeah. two times he went to the hospital, he had no symptoms, yeah. but he was put on antiviral drugs mm. uh, both times. And yes. antiviral drugs can, can uh, cause kidney failure, they can cause liver failure, they can cause severe blood abnormalities. So it would be perfectly possible for the hospital to kill him Mm. with giving him drugs when he started off with no symptoms at all yeah so like this is a kind of human guinea pig experiment uh, don't you think it is like a you know, human guinea pig experiment that they are giving this drugs which uh, which have no uh, benefits but they have uh, proven damages to the body and uh, how come people are surviving these drugs even if they are given these drugs um well you know i think um people who are not that sick yeah. can withstand pharmaceutical drugs for some time. You know, yeah. hydroxychloroquine in most people is not that toxic. Mm. There are some people for which it is. Yeah. Um, uh, there, a recent study showed that hydroxychloroquine increased the death rate 
so did yeah. chloroquine yeah and that it's significantly increased the the uh, the rate of heart arrhythmias yeah um remdesivir is an antiviral drug that's extremely toxic mm. and there's there's really so far only evidence that it increases the death rate there's no yes. evidence that decreases the death rate um but it won't kill everybody yes. but if you're 90 years old mm. and you have a weak kidney or yeah. a weak liver or a weak yeah. heart yes. then it may well kill you yeah absolutely if you're so. if you're 30 and uh, you're asymptomatic mm. then you can probably take these drugs for a few weeks and yes. won't do you major damage yeah uh, sir i would like to uh, share my screen for a second mm -hmm. yes sir as you can see uh, one of my friends sent me this paper and he's a uh, he's giving the argument that if uh, the virus does didn't exist the pathogenesis of the virus did not the unique pathogenesis as as told by doctors uh, would not uh, be existent like uh, like the uh, you know diagram shown here where they are saying that it enters through the respiratory tract and goes to the ace2 receptor and uh, the events of the uh, uh, immune system follow on so what will you comment on this well it's a nice picture it's yeah. total speculation yeah there's limited data to support it yeah and uh, it's it's funny that they can claim that they have all this knowledge about how the virus works and yet yes. they can't prove that the virus exists yeah absolutely sir so so i i mean it's like the pictures of the virus the mm. most of the pictures of the virus are computer graphics yes yes, uh, yes that have no you know no basis in in reality yes uh, and and this is is the same thing i've seen similar pictures for the development of antibodies but when yeah. you look at the data the mm. data doesn't match the pictures yes, because yes. the pictures are just what a scientist thinks mm. and i believe this picture has no source mm. uh you know for the data that would be in this in this picture it yeah. is just an illustration of what the author of the the paper thinks happens yes absolutely so this is a, like a computer program uh, they have made that this is the probable pathogenesis of the virus yeah so when they say probable mm. then they, that means they don't know yeah and it it's a uh, you know it's incredibly simplistic mm. and uh, you know the reality is when you look at data mm. not all the data fits any simplistic model yeah there's always data that does not fit indicating that there are um you know large parts of the behavior of these systems that we do not yes. Under, understand yes yes absolutely sir and uh, um, for a, for a person to understand is it is very hard for a common person like me i have i am facing difficulty to read this research paper and uh, i don't have a dr in front of my name so i cannot even argue with the, the people if uh, if the government is forcing some laws with me so it is very difficult for common citizens to uh, do this so what will you uh, and uh, uh, i read your excellent uh, document on the flaws in the coronavirus theory so it, it was a really great article and my friends also liked it but uh, uh, all my friends were asking that who is mr david crow and is he a doctor uh, should uh, should people who don't have a dr should be trusted so what will you recommend uh, how 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 should common citizens do research uh, independently well i think they should do what i did which yeah. is to read the scientific articles yeah uh, to read government documents yes to read manufacturer documents yeah to read um uh, newspaper articles that contain facts about the you know the number of cases or or mm. or something like that yes. there's often newspaper articles that have important information in them that's not yet in a scientific paper mm. uh and be prepared to cite your sources yeah. i mean what would you prefer to believe a phd who talks for an hour and doesn't give any sources or somebody without a phd who who writes a paper that has 80 references yes and that if you if you question anything in the paper mm. you can just go to the reference and you can read it yourself 
and you can decide whether um, what's in the article was an accurate representation or not. And, yes. and I've been extremely careful because if I make any mistakes, mm. people will attack me if yeah. I make one mistake. That is what the focus will be. Yeah, yes. and, and so I try not to make mistakes. If I do make a mistake, I have made a few um, minor mistakes. Mm. I apologize. I correct my paper mm. and I, I move on. Yeah. So, sir, uh, uh, coming to the coming back to the PCR testing, uh, I, I looked at the CDC document and it is still not FDA approved. The, the testing kit and still they are using and they are giving arguments that because the virus is very uh, prevalent in the population, then they have the permission for the emergency use of this testing kit. And uh, uh, if that, and when I say that the testing kit is wrong, they, they may be sometimes accepted, but they don't deny that the virus exists. They say that this is a more dangerous thing that the kit is not working, but virus is everywhere. So the argument, uh, like how should I answer these people? Well, these are these are really the same question is yeah. if the test is not accurate yeah then the only way we can see the virus is through the test yeah and so if the test is not accurate there's no virus mm. you know if if somebody has a false positive mm. there is no virus in their body and yes. if 80 percent of the people who are being tested who are mm. asymptomatic don't have the virus then there are massive numbers of people who, yes. who are not infected. Yes. So you cannot separate the accuracy of the test from the prevalence of the mm. virus. Yes. And if the prevalence of the virus is much, much lower, mm. and if many of the people who are dying in reality mm. do not have the virus, then you have to ask, why is there so much tension on, yeah. on, this, on this virus? Yes. So this chain of events started from China, sir. And uh, I basically, you know, uh, as a person, I'm not able to find alternate sources of information uh, criticizing the pandemic theory. And uh, uh, a lot of times p people are just, you know, uh, to uh, take our attention to somewhere else. They're saying that this virus came from a lab or this came from a market. And these all things I have observed that these are total misleading and uh, making, uh, making people think that this is a very dangerous thing and not actually coming to the factor of the Koch's postulate and the isolation of the virus, etc. So uh, in uh, what uh, escalated this, uh, according to you, what escalated this events, uh, uh, the, uh, the event of the deaths occurring in China in the month of February or January when the pandemic started? I, I think there's, there's uh, two stages. There's yeah. what escalated it in China yeah. and what escalated it in the rest of the world. Yes. So in China, one yeah. doctor who was an ophthalmologist who, mm. who had no specific knowledge in this area mm. said that there are seven people in isolation in this hospital in Wuhan. Mm. Wuhan, a city of 11 million people. Yeah. And he said that my hospital is covering up a new epidemic. Now, mm. why would he know anything about this? He's an ophthalmologist. Yes. The doctors in the hospital, they, they said, you're crazy. Mm. But he wrote an email that went to the West. Mm -hmm. I believe that the Chinese government wants to make a lot of money off selling vaccines yes. and drugs to the West. Mm. Yeah. So they have to be seen as adhering to Western standards. Mm. So the Chinese government was embarrassed and they said, we're going to take this seriously. Mm. We're going to lock down Wuhan. We're going to eliminate the virus. Mm. And of course they didn't mm. because if the test is producing false positives, you can test in Tibet, you can mm. test in Beijing, you can test in Hong Kong and you're going to find positive tests everywhere. Yes. Yes. But the, so that led to the Chinese government enforcing this massive lockdown, you know, mm tighter than anywhere else in the world. Yeah. And then the story that was prevalent at the time was that the virus came from Chinese people eating bats. Yeah. Now, I've talked to some Chinese people mm. and so far nobody knows anybody who's ever eaten a bat. Mm. But, you know, maybe it's happened. Yeah. But I think that the West uh, believes that in China people eat all kinds of disgusting things and therefore they believed the story that the virus had come out of a bat cave, into a market, into Wuhan, mm. into the rest of the world. Yeah. This, this was just believed. And then um, 
the West started doing the same, they started the same mistake as China. They mm. started testing. Mm -hmm. The first test in Italy that was positive was a, a man who had no travel history mm. and no contact with anybody who could possibly have been to Wuhan or was a victim or anything like that. Yes. But they said, this is a case. Yeah. And within 24 hours, they had 30 other cases, yes. none of which had contact with the first case. Yes, yes. But they believed the test. Mm -hmm. And as they did more testing, mm -hmm. they found more cases. Yes. And, and they felt that they had found something. Mm -hmm. And it's true in Italy that there is a cluster of cases in the north. Mm -hmm. But there's a very strong correlation between testing positive mm -hmm. and air pollution. Yes. So I think it's not a cluster. It mm. is that there are more people with injured respiratory systems in the north of Italy. Yeah. Wuhan also has bad air. Yeah. And a lot of other clusters are in places like New York, which mm. has bad air quality. Mm. So I think places with bad air quality have much higher um, uh, rates of mm. positive tests. Yes. And it looks like they're clusters of infection. Yes. But they're actually not. They're clusters of air pollution. Yes. So uh, for a for a person, for a common person, it seems very strange that they close the seafood, they opened the seafood market uh, immediately. And even the when, when the West were really, uh, you know, angry with them about why they have opened this market and the virus has generated from this market only. But they uh, this seems to be very strange that they opened the market and also... Uh, in India, there is one uh, there, there is one doctor named as uh, Doctor Vishwarup Rai Chaudhary, and uh, this he's uh, I think the most famous uh, doctor who is opposing this uh, current uh, mainstream theory of uh, coronavirus. And he actually interviewed a person, Doctor Ali from Wuhan, and Doctor Ali said that uh, the lockdown only took place for about a week in uh, Wuhan, and everything opened and, uh, very naturally back again. So, uh, do you think that uh, the lockdown only lasted for one week in Wuhan? Uh, I have no information on this, but, mm. but I think that China represents to the West what they think the West wants to hear. Mm. Uh, right now, it appears that they are testing many people in Wuhan, mm. but the rate of positive tests is unbelievably low. Mm. And, and so it is possible that the Chinese, understanding the flaws in the RNA test, decided yeah. that they would run the test with, say, 20 cycles yes. instead of 45, yes. which would mean that almost nobody would test positive. Yes. And they might run the test with three genes. This is something I didn't mention before, but you mm. can run the test with one, two, or three genes, yes. and then you can decide if you, if you run it for two genes and you only get one, is that positive or not? Yeah. So the Chinese could say, we're going to run it for three genes, and all mm. three genes have to be positive. Mm. If you did that the test would be negative in almost everybody. And then yes. China can say to the rest of the world, we've conquered the virus. Yeah. Now, if the West did that, they could also say they've conquered the virus, but mm. the West, Western doctors are not imaginative enough yes, yes. Uh, to understand this. Mm -hmm. So, sir, uh, one of the argument I get uh, from people when I tell them that China must have must have uh, misled the world uh, for uh, earning profits uh, through the medical system, but uh, they give me arguments that okay, they they might be earning profits through the medical system, but their uh, overall business uh, might have become uh, low because the other industries who ship normally ship uh, Ch Chinese products that ship uh, to other countries. Uh, might have become low. The businesses might have become low because of the total pandemic. So uh, what do you think about the total Chinese economy? Have their economy lessened because of the lockdown? Because of, sorry, because uh, of the pandemic? Uh, some people think that all of this is planned. Mm. It, it's possible that the Chinese government, I mean, I'm just speculating, said mm. we need to protect our pharmaceutical industry. Mm. And to do that, we need to take this seriously. Mm. Nobody, I think, understood the consequences of what they were doing. Mm. Everybody did something independently. Mm. They never thought this is going to destroy the airline industry. Mm. This is around the world. This is going to destroy the tourism industry around the world. Mm. Nobody had considered that. The, uh, public health officials live within a tiny little box. And all they can think about is viruses and 
epidemiology and pandemics and things like that. Mm -hmm. They have no concept of the real world. Mm -hmm. In the real world, there are airlines and there are hotels and mm -hmm. there are restaurants yes. and there are beaches where people go for holidays. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that they ever thought about the consequences of their theories on people's ordinary life. Yeah. I mean, you know, people in, in India, you know, they might, uh, you know, want to go to a, a local temple. If they have yes. a couple of days off, they might go to a town that has um, an old fort and mm. uh, uh, some beautiful temples and some gardens and things like that. Mm. Mm. I mean, those are things that were destroyed by mm. the virologists. But I don't think that the virologists ever thought, you know, let's destroy the airline industry. Mm. Let's destroy the tourism industry. You know, let's put millions of people out of work so that mm. people are starving. Yeah. I just don't think they thought about it. Yeah. So definitely, uh, when I argue with people, uh, they say that who who is all behind this? So I don't want to get uh, into things and uh, theories that who is behind this. But I think uh, why don't the owners who uh, owners of the big businesses who um, who might have slightly got an idea that this might be a uh, this might be a pandemic, uh, which is a fake pandemic or which is not true. So why they are not approaching the government and uh, telling them that please open up the economy? We are taught from our youngest years mm. a a about viruses and bacteria and infectious diseases. Mm. And, and we are taught that the information about these things is absolutely accurate. We were told stories about old epidemics, the 1918 flu epidemic. Yes. We don't know how true those are. And, and so the president of an airline or the president of a major factory, all they've been taught their entire life is propaganda. And so I think they sincerely believed that this was a, a threat to the entire world and had to be taken seriously. I think if there had been some uh, business leaders who were critical thinkers who had tried to gather around other business leaders and to oppose this, yeah. uh, they could have stopped this. Mm. Uh, but all I'm seeing from business is we're trying our hardest in these difficult times, even companies that are putting themselves out of business. Mm. Um, you know, uh, around North America, clothing companies have gone bankrupt and mm. restaurants have gone bankrupt and mm. airlines are going bankrupt. Mm. So much destruction to the economy and, and with all the destruction to the economy, people lose jobs and that destroys people's lives. They don't mm. know how they're going to feed their family. Mm. Um, it's, it's all been terrible and it, I think it's all been unplanned. Yeah. Uh, this, this is not a planned event. This was yeah. uh, some people decided that the most important thing in the world was protecting us from the virus yes. and had no idea of the destruction that that would create. Yeah, yeah absolutely, sir. And uh, people are now so terrified that they are like uh, wiping their, uh, you know, the bag, the shopping bags with uh, alcohol and everything like that. And they're extensively using this sanitizers uh, and things which are actually harmful uh, to our skin. And uh, what do you think the implication of wearing masks and uh, uh, like quarantining and uh, using sanitizers extensively and uh, only talking to people over the internet? What will the social consequences uh, on, or the impact on the immune system will be because of this? Well, I'm worried about a, a lot of health problems. Mm. Um, children in schools, for example, will be in a classroom that is sanitized every day. Yeah. So every day they will be breathing in the chemicals that were used yeah. to clean the school the last night. Yeah. So I think we will uh, have an increase in cases of asthma, of other respiratory diseases, mm. probably an increase in cancer, mm. uh, an increase in skin disorders. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, with, with masks, we may have an increase in respiratory diseases because mm. you're, you're not breathing fresh air. Yeah. Um, we will have an increase in diabetes amongst children because children mm. are not getting exercise. Mm. Uh, we will have children who are not properly socialized, mm. children who don't know how to interact with other children, who yes. um, are scared or are aggressive yeah. when they're finally allowed to mix with other people. 
the consequences of this are <clears throat> almost infinite. And it will take us time to realize what the most severe consequences are. Yeah. And, and as I said, nobody thought about the consequences. Nobody yeah. thought about the increased risk of suicide, for example. Mm. Uh, in the United States, they're noticing a dramatic increase in risks of suicide mm. because people are sent home by themselves. They, they don't have, uh, I mean, for some people, going to work is their only social interaction. Yeah. So you send them home and they have no social interaction. Yes. And if they're, if they're depressed, they're going to fall into a desire for suicide very easily. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm a psychology student and I can understand the effects of isolation that it has. And, uh, and on people who like, who are uh, extroverts, then this is, this is very destructive, who like to meet people every day. This is very destructive. And sir, uh, coming to the antibody testing, because like recently in my city, Pune, they have uh, developed a antibody test, which they claim that it is 90% uh, specificity of this test. So what problems do you see in the antibody test, sir? Because they are very fast. Uh, and what problems are there in it? Um, every manufacturer of tests, whether it's PCR or antibody, claims that their tests are 99% accurate. Yes. Because you can't get a test approved unless mm. it claims to be 99 or close to 99% accurate. Mm. <clears throat> um, the manufacturers are in charge of testing their own tests. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you remember the Volkswagen scandal in the United, in the United States where Volkswagen was um, cheating on mm. the gas mileage tests. Oh, yes. yeah, I um, it, Right. So this was a big corporation that wanted to, to be able to advertise that they had the best gas mileage. Mm -hmm. So they cheated. Um, mm. So we, we can't, uh, we cannot rely totally on what the tests say. Yes. One of the, the interesting things about antibody tests mm. is that they are testing generally at very low numbers. Yes. Between one and 5%. Yeah. Yet uh, antibody tests reflect everybody who's been infected since the beginning. Yes. So yes. everybody, in, say, if they tested people in Canada where I live, mm. everybody who was infected in January should be antibody positive. Everybody yeah. infected in February, everybody yeah. infected in March, April, May, they should yeah. all be antibody positive. Yes. When they do a PCR test mm. for an infection, that is just today. Mm. Maybe mm. yesterday I was, anti I was PCR negative. Mm. Maybe mm. tomorrow I'll be PCR negative. All mm. the PCR test says is today you are positive. And mm. yet the percentage testing positive on PCR mm. is often 10 times higher. Yeah, absolutely. So this makes no sense. Yeah. Antibody tests in places that have had a lot of cases mm. should now be up at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. And, yeah. and they're not. They're down in very low numbers. Yeah. So I don't trust uh, the antibody test yeah. uh, at, at all because of these, these low numbers that are being produced. Yeah. So uh, supposedly this antibody test uh, is giving uh, results for some antibodies that are produced because of COVID-19. But do you think that any other viruses or any other medical conditions will give antibodies uh, for this COVID-19? Well, one of the things the manufacturers do is they often test their antibody tests on other conditions. Mm. And several manufacturers noted mm. that their tests tested positive with other viruses, bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, autoimmune conditions. So yeah. we, we know that's the case. Yeah. One study in Holland looked at old blood samples from 2018. Mm. And they found that 14% Mm. of old blood samples tested positive. Mm. How can this be? Yes. You know, either the virus was circulating in Holland two years ago, yeah. in which case it's obviously not a problem, yes, yes. or the antibody test is not accurate. Yeah. So the, in general, the amount of validation that has been done is not mm. sufficient. Okay. Uh, another problem is that we don't know that all the tests are saying the same thing. Yeah. Nobody has taken say 10 different antibody tests mm. and um, taken blood and run the same blood through all 10 tests mm. for say a thousand people. Yeah. Because what we could find is that 
there are samples that are positive on one and negative on the other three, mm. uh, samples that are positive on three and negative on one. Mm. A, a journalist in England uh, believed that she had the coronavirus. She had yeah. been sick about a yeah. month ago. Yes, yes. So she got four different antibody tests mm. and she tested herself mm. four times and she was positive twice and negative twice. Mm. So the antibody tests definitely have problems. They've not been properly validated and we have really no idea what it means. Yes. We have no idea if it means that you're protected. Mm. Um, more importantly, we have no idea that if you test negative, it means that you could become sick mm. from coronavirus. We, yes. we have no idea what these tests mean. Yeah. So, sir, uh, uh, if other countries would have uh, used a model like uh, Sweden, where we quarantine only the healthy, only the diseased people, or maybe who are at risk, who are immunocompromised, and uh, all the healthy people would have gone out uh, to to their usual routines. So, uh, if why did not governments did uh, use this kind of strategy, like quarantining the unhealthy and keeping the healthy outside? Well. Uh, I don't believe that quarantining the unhealthy is a good idea. Yeah. Uh, I think that leads to uh, situations where the, the doctors use the wrong treatment because there's nobody observing, mm. uh, observing them. Mm. Um, but it, it's been very clear from the beginning mm. that this, isn't, this is a disease that does not affect young people, mm. that the death rate amongst people under 30 is almost zero. Yeah. It, is, it is insane. Mm. So definitely people under 60 who were healthy mm. should have been allowed to do whatever they wanted. Mm. Get on an airplane, go to a restaurant, yeah. go to the beach, mm. um, you know, whatever they wanted, go to school, mm. go to work. That mm. should have all been um, uh, affected. Yeah. Uh, there should have been maybe been more precautions for older people, but I, I don't believe, I believe that isolation of old people kills them. Yeah, it kills them because they have nothing to live for, mm. and it kills them because the children mm. of the old people are the ones who monitor the care. Yeah, I, I personally experienced um, the mother of a relative, mm. um, and and this relative went to the hospital and said, "Why is my mother um, unresponsive?" Yes, and they said we put her on morphine. Oh. Why did you put her on morphine? Mm. Because she started crying in the middle of the night. Mm. She started crying in the middle of the night. Mm. So uh, this relative made a big fuss and said, this is absolutely ridiculous. There, there's nothing wrong with her. Mm. If she cries in the middle of the night, make her a cup of tea, sit beside her, hold her hand, tell her mm. everything's okay, and she'll go back to sleep in five minutes. Mm. Just take some time. But the nurses didn't want to be bothered. So if this relative had not been present, the old lady would have stayed on morphine and probably would have died relatively quickly. And in reality, she lived another five years. Mm. And, and I think this is what's been happening. The isolation has had dramatic consequences and it has ended the life of a lot of old people. So my personal opinion is that nobody should have been isolated or quarantined. Yes, absolutely, sir. And uh, come if uh, you know a person like me starts to research this Cox postulates, then he starts to recognize that uh, earlier viruses were also were not satisfied. Do you think earlier viruses and bacteria were actually satisfied for Cox postulates? Well, it's clear that there are you know diseases that, for which bacteria play a role. Mm. I'm not always sure it's it's the entire role, like tuberculosis, mm. Mm. for example, I, I think is a, is a response to lung damage. Yeah. Um, but I mean, people get infected wounds and they're colonized by bacteria. And mm. so, you know, bacteria can definitely cause problems. And then, of course, we have a lot of parasitic infections mm. that cause real problems. Mm. So if we just talk about viruses, mm. I would say that every viral disease that I've looked at has an environmental cause mm. that better explains the pattern of who gets sick and what kind of symptoms they have. Like polio, for example, mm. is um, highly correlated with the use of pesticides. Yes. Pesticides can cause paralysis. Mm. 
So it should not be uh, surprising. And uh, so, and in the case of AIDS amongst gay men, it, AIDS is more complicated because there's many different groups. Yeah. If we just take gay men, yeah, gay men were heavy users of a drug called poppers, which is yes. immunosuppressive and yeah. carcinogenic. Yeah. So again, yeah. there is an environmental cause mm. for AIDS, at least amongst gay men, mm. that gives better explanations for what we're seeing than mm. the viral theory. Yes, sir. And... Uh, uh, as a as a indian person you know as, as an indian kid when i was growing up major things uh, that uh, were around me was polio i was uh, definitely there were advertisements for polio for tuberculosis uh, for this swine flu uh, uh, swine flu malaria etc so we were like from the uh, childhood we were told that these are very dangerous diseases and uh, polio they told that from 1974 india started to mass vaccinate people uh, using polio and the rates really dropped down uh, uh and the absolute last case was seen in 2011 and uh, they they told us that uh, nearby countries like pakistan and african countries like nigeria niger etc are still experiencing polio cases because they are not doing mass vaccination and that is the proof that vaccinations for polio work and polio is caused by a virus so what will you comment on this sir the World Health Organization keeps track of a disease called acute flaccid paralysis, yeah. AFP. Yes. What is the difference between AFP and polio? If we're talking about a disease, mm. there is no difference. Mm. The World Health Organization documents more than 100,000 cases of AFP every year. The okay. only difference between AFP and polio is mm. that the virus is not found. Mm. So if the virus was never the cause of polio, Mm. India still has polio. It is just yes. called acute flaccid paralysis. Yeah. And I think also there are many other paralytic disorders, mm. Guillain Barre syndrome, mm. meningitis, encephalitis. Those are mm. things that can cause paralysis that mm. are blamed on other viruses or blamed on mm. other things. So yeah. there are still many people in, in, in uh, India being paralyzed. Mm. It's just that there's nobody being paralyzed with something that's called polio. Yes. So actually, the uh, you are trying to say that the recategorization of the illness of polio to other illnesses uh, actually lessened the numbers of polio. Y yes. Yes. Uh -huh. I mean, they, they, um, the number of cases of acute flaccid paralysis mm. went from uh, I think around fifty thousand in the nineteen nineties mm. to over a hundred thousand in recent years. Mm there's been a massive increase in this disease, which is clinically identical to polio. Yes. I mean, if, if you had a, a, an eight-year-old child who got mm. paralyzed, mm. We, would you care if it was polio or AFP? Yeah, I mean, the fact is your child's paralyzed. Yes. That's the problem. Mm. Mm. And so if you can't eliminate paralysis, mm. what are you doing? Yeah. And, and the reason why the West takes polio seriously and doesn't take AFP seriously is because mm. polio is believed to be infectious. So yes. they believe, selfishly, the yeah. West, that if polio comes back in India, mm. then polio will come back to Canada and England and the United mm. States. Mm. If Indian children are being paralyzed by something that's believed to be non-infectious, like AFP, they don't care mm. because that non-infectious cause is not going to affect Canada and the United States and England. So they mm. only care when it's an infectious disease, because then they believe it will, it, it will affect them. So yes. this belief that the West is being philanthropic, is being mm. generous, mm. cares about uh, third world countries is mm. a complete fabrication. They yes. only care when they believe that it will kill them. Yes, absolutely, sir. And uh, one more question I receive uh, for polio is that uh, they say uh, if uh, if uh, people like you and me are giving an argument that this lead arsenic poisoning is uh, leading to polio, then they say that why are the children in the cities getting infected? Because the, only the pharma, uh, the crops uh, have these pesticides sprayed on. So why uh, people in the cities are getting polio or may have gotten um, polio? In the United States in the 1950s, polio was highly associated with the fruit harvest. Mm. And I believe that some fruit is contaminated, heavily contaminated with pesticides. Mm -hmm. And uh, so let's say that you had a family and there was a six-year-old and you brought a bunch of strawberries mm. 
Mm. And the six-year-old ate, you know, a lot of strawberries. Mm. Maybe mm. He, he got the strawberries when nobody was looking and ate mm. a bunch mm. and mm. then becomes paralyzed. There were lots of cases like that. So mm. children in the city eat fruit that came mm. from farmers who yes. use pesticides carelessly. Yeah. And I think that there are occasionally um, bunches of fruit or other or vegetables or other things like that mm. that are heavily contaminated. Mm. And therefore, this paralysis will affect city children randomly. Mm. It, it depends who is it who eats this basket of vegetables that is uh, contaminated. Yeah. So, sir, uh, there are, are there any studies uh, which say that uh, because I, I'm actually uh, uh, acting a little bit like a devil, devil's advocate, but are there any studies that show that vaccinations for polio have been worked? Because a lot of people, a uh, lot of experts without giving any sources directly say that vaccinations were directly the effect of redu reduction of this. And they took a group uh, who were polio patients and uh, the vaccinations were perfectly effective. Just, just let me wrap something. Yeah. So this is the report mm. on the polio field trial. Okay. And there is, is one table in this report mm. uh, that is the only table that says that the polio vaccine worked. Mm. Just this one table of data. Now, yes. you, you can't see it, but I, I can say that there were a very small number of uh, cases of paralysis after the field trial. Mm. And uh, that was the only positive statistic that came out of the uh, field trial. Mm. However, there's indications in here that the statistic is not true. And mm. I, I could go into the detail. Yes. But what we know was that in 1952, was a dramatic peak of polio. Mm. By the time the field trial happened, mm. the, the polio cases had dropped in half. Mm. So at least half the cases had nothing to do with the vaccine. Okay. By 1960, mm. the number of cases of polio was reduced to 5% of the 1952 peak. And mm. yet by 1960, less than half of the vulnerable population had been vaccinated. So there was no herd immunity. Yes. So it's clear that the polio vaccine did not eliminate polio. Yes. That is a lie. And it's a lie that if you look at the history, if you look at the polio statistics and you look mm. at when the vaccine came out mm. and you look at when there was close to 100% vaccination, it was mm. impossible for the vaccine to have um, yes. eliminated polio. Not only that, but after the vaccine came out, for two years, there was an increase in polio mm. cases yeah. before it dropped again. Because yeah. some of the polio vaccines were much worse than others. And one polio vaccine in particular had to be taken off the market mm. because it was causing too many cases of paralysis. Yes. So the vaccine can definitely cause paralysis. Mm. And in fact, I think if cases of polio around the world, most of those cases are due to the vaccine. Yes, this is, sir, this is very shocking news for me because we have been indoctrinated to believe that polio was a very dangerous disease and uh, there were mass, mass campaigns about polio vaccination. I myself had polio vaccination and uh, the realizing that this is all very wrong is very shocking and I cannot digest mm -hmm. it and normal people absolutely cannot digest this news and, uh, you know, totally makes me rethink about the medical, uh, all the medical organizations that actually claim to work for our benefit. I don't know if you're religious, but if, if you are religious, whether you're mm. Hindu or Catholic yeah, Hindu. or Muslim, mm. you will be taught a lot of things that every other religion in the world will say are false. Mm. So if you are a Catholic, you will be taught that um, Mary had a baby, even mm. though she was a virgin, yeah. right? Incredible things like that. Yeah. That an angel came down to mm. he from heaven to mm. visit Mary. Mm. Now, if you ask a Muslim or a mm. Hindu mm. or a Buddhist, they will say that's just nonsense. Yes, absolutely. So what we have is a religion of medicine where we are told all these things. In general, there's limited evidence or no evidence to back these things up. But we are taught to behave as 
if this was a religion. If somebody is a priest, that mm. is, they have a PhD or an MD, mm. then we are supposed to respect them just mm. like uh, um, a, a Hindu mm. who is a fervent believer would go to the temple and if a priest of mm. the temple says something, then you accept that yeah. as the truth because they are closer to God than you. And it's the same thing with medical science. It has become a religion and we're supposed to believe the religion. Yes, absolutely, sir. Because right now, uh, all these uh, medical doctors and workers have, have become gods. Uh, they have been projected like gods for us. And even like in India, even they, they gave us salute from the plane, uh, they, uh, everything. And they, uh, you know, uh, took a lot of uh, the took a lot of money and uh, used like jumbo jets and uh, which uh, played uh, which paid honor to the medical frontline medical uh, health worker so uh, uh, at times like this uh, fearful citizens you know uh, for them medical uh, doctors are like gods for them and they cannot question the god even if the god is not quoting any sources and not giving any sources uh, so, sir, coming uh, to the uh, Spanish flu, because uh, Spanish flu is very relevant to India, because most number of people, I think, who died from Spanish flu were Indians. And I think uh, the uh, analogy of, uh, sorry, the procedure of quarantining, uh, did it come from the Spanish flu? Uh, and uh, were the Spanish flu re uh, numbers real? And uh, if, if, it, uh, if it was real, then... Uh, how did the people, the soldiers who came from the war back to India uh, during one month of this uh, travel did, uh, did not, you know, kill the virus supposedly because they had a one month period of quarantine because they were in the ships for one month? Um, yeah, you ask some good questions. Quarantine yeah. did not come from the 1918 flu. Mm. Quarantine is an Italian word. Quarantena means 40 days. Mm. And uh, now it's 14, you know, for mm. quarantine, but it was originally 40 days. Mm. And I believe those 40 days come from the Bible. If, okay. if people are Christian, they know of the story that Jesus went into the desert for 40 days mm. and was tempted by the devil. Mm. And I believe this is the origin of the 40 day quarantine. Yeah. 40 days was too much. So it, mm. it became 14 days. Mm. But I studied the 1630 epidemic in Milan. Mm. And they used quarantine in, in those days. They used mm. quarantine. They took people out of their houses and they put them in, in a place together with other people they believed were infected. Yes. And of course, it did no good back in 1630. And it does no good now. In New York City, where they quarantined people more harshly than anywhere else in the United States, mm. <clears throat> the governor announced that two thirds of new cases came from people who'd been quarantined. Mm. People who had not left their house because they were yeah. tired or unemployed. So, so quarantine clearly does not work. Your observation that people were on the boat for mm. too long mm. is a good one. Mm. Um, and two other examples of boats and the 1918 mm. flu. Mm. A, a lot of American soldiers mm. got the flu crossing the Atlantic mm. at, towards the end of World War I. But the sailors on the boats did not get sick. Yeah. Now, why was that? Well, the, the soldiers were given thin uniforms. Mm. They were not used to being on a boat. They got mm. sick. Mm. Um, they were cold. Mm. The sailors had thick clothing. They were used to being on a boat in the middle of the winter and the Atlantic. Mm. And uh, so they were prepared. Mm. Uh, another boat story is, is a boat went from Seattle to Alaska, which in mm. 1918 was a long, long journey. And uh, everybody on the boat was healthy. Nobody on the boat was sick. Mm. But when the boat got to Alaska, an epidemic of influenza broke out. Yeah. It was an epidemic of fear. Mm. Everybody heard that this boat was coming and they said, oh my God, this boat is bringing uh, the, the flu from Seattle. Mm, yes. And so when the boat arrived, people started getting sick and they all blamed it on the people on the boat who were perfectly healthy. Mm. And they'd been on the boat long enough that if they had, um, if any of them had the virus, they would have got sick before they got to Alaska and none yes. of them did. Yeah. 
So this is a very strange thing to hear because we have been all taught that Spanish flu was this dangerous epidemic. And what do you think about the death numbers? Were they true? Well, I, I, I think the death numbers were were created many years after the epidemic. Mm. They were they were not created at the time. Yes. And and I think um, you know if it's if it's 1930 mm. and uh, you're trying to estimate deaths in India in 1918. Mm. It, it would be virtually impossible. And, and yeah, so you could yeah. probably come up with a huge number, mm. which was completely meaningless. Yes. yes. An, another example of, of why I don't believe that there was a high death rate. Mm. Uh, it was a famous public health official in the United States named mm. Joseph Goldberger. People mm. still talk about him today. Mm. And he did an experiment where he took victims of the flu, mm. people dying of what was believed to be 1918 flu. Mm. And he took prisoners from a jail. Mm. Yes. And he he stuck a swab up the nose of the sick people and then he put it up the nose of the prisoners. Yes. And he put a swab down their throat. Yeah. And he put it down the throat of the prisoners. Yeah. He had the sick people sneeze directly mm. into the face of the prisoners. Yes. Not a single prisoner got sick. So it was clear that this illness was not infectious. Yes, very shocking. What could be causing it? Well, Aspirin was a new drug in 1918, relatively new, and it was mm. seen as a wonder drug. Mm. Yet high doses of aspirin can cause liver failure and many other things. Um, there were many remedies made from silver, other metals. There were vaccines that were created. So many people out of fear of the virus took remedies that might have killed them. And yes. then of course, when they died, they died of the 1918 mm. flu. The uh, same but, as mm. happening here. If, you, if you're coronavirus positive and you die, you get shot in the head by a gun, that's going to be recorded as a coronavirus death. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Very shocking. And sir, were there any uh, vaccination involved uh, in the death of the persons from the Spanish flu? I, I believe there were many uh, vaccines that were produced. I've read about vaccines being produced. Mm. Um, you know, shockingly, you know, probably completely unsanitary. Yeah. And, and probably killed a, a lot of people. But I don't know, you know, what percentage of people took vaccines. There, there was no single vaccine program mm. yes. back then. Yes. Yeah. Sir, uh, coming to the, uh, because uh, rediscovering this, uh, discovering these things about Koch's postulate led me to think about the germ theory. And uh, which, which side do you stand on, sir, the Terran theory or the germ theory? Well, I think my work on viruses says that, um, you know, what we believe are viral diseases are pretty much all environmental diseases mm. or imaginary diseases. Mm. Like if, if somebody is coronavirus positive and they're asymptomatic, mm. they're not sick. Mm. There is no disease. Yeah. So we don't need to explain, um, is it terrain or germ? Mm. There's a third option, which is mm. nothing. Mm. <laughs> that, that people are, are perfectly healthy. Mm. They just happen to have uh, some RNA in their body that most people mm. don't have. Yeah. And, and this is actually true of many people. With HIV, for example... Mm. If you test positive on an antibody test, mm. you're likely perfectly healthy. Mm. And yet you will be told that you have a deadly illness. Yeah. So I think we, we need to consider the three. Mm. The, the germs, which I mostly reject. Mm. The terrain, which mm. I accept for mm. people who are sick. Mm. And then nothing for mm. people who have a test that's positive, but actually have no disease. And I yeah. do not think we should be telling people that you're you're positive for the coronavirus, you need to be quarantined, you may get sick, you're positive mm. for HIV, mm. you, you need to, um, you know, not have unprotected sex, um, yeah. you will get sick within 10 years, right? Yes. We are predicting um, death of people on the basis of tests, which are flawed. Yes, sir, uh, like, coming to vaccinations because uh, right now I recently uh, started to become skeptical towards vaccinations because of the, all this movement and all these uh, things are recognized about COVID-19. So, uh, you know, a gut feeling of a normal person, you know, tells, uh, tells us that has uh, uh, the body which is made by whoever, God or evolution, uh, whatever, uh, is this body, you know, uh, has some flaws that uh, external uh, chemical 
has to be put in the body uh, to make us better is the well i would only accept a vaccine that underwent a double blind true placebo controlled trial mm. with disease as an endpoint mm. so for example if um if you want a disease to protect against polio mm. then i would say that it had to be a proper double blind test mm. we would have to know what the placebo was mm. the placebo has no ingredients of the vaccine in it mm. and we would have to see the number of cases of polio at the end of that yes. and you know that's what this this uh, 1954 uh yeah. field trial claimed to do yes. but it's heavily flawed but mm. for modern vaccines they generally just see if the vaccine creates antibodies mm. that is not proof that it will protect you from illness yes and the vaccines include increasingly dangerous uh, chemicals particularly various forms of aluminum mm. and i think aluminum in vaccines is becoming a big scandal and that the newer and newer vaccines are much more dangerous and the vaccines cannot produce antibodies without the aluminum mm. so the vaccine manufacturers are in this in this situation where they can't persuade the government that the vaccine works even through the production of antibodies without putting in stronger and stronger forms of aluminum but those cause more and more side effects and the side mm. effects can be devastating they can yes. completely destroy somebody's life yes uh sir uh, like a like a common individual when i search on the internet and uh, when i debate with people uh when i search that like, two vaccines cause harm or two vaccines cause autism there are like uh, uh, articles from jama and everything uh, that say that there is no link between autism and this is a conspiracy theory or a myth so a person who wants to really uh, investigate this things that are vaccines causing this this kind of uh, autism autism adhd diseases so where can they find the sources because actually the mainstream the search results of uh, search results have been captured by the mainstream media or the main mainstream search engine so where can we search this data for vaccine harm um well there is um there is a, a paper and i'll give you the, i'll put the link in in uh, in the chat window sure sir um which um documents 157 papers and it, it might mm. be longer now yeah um that show an association between vaccines and autism Yes. So it is a complete lie that there are no papers that show mm. a connection between vaccines and autism. Now yeah. proving that vaccines cause autism is more difficult. Um but parents who observe their children going from perfectly healthy to terribly autistic within uh, a few days mm. and the only thing unusual in their life was vaccines. Yes. I think we need to take those seriously. I mean that is pretty close to causal proof. Absolutely. You no, know, if it was one parent and one child, you could say well that's that's all it is, but there are hundreds of parents who have experienced the same thing and science is not interested in their mm. experiences. Mm. Uh but in many cases it seems impossible to come up with any other explanation. Mm. People will say well this was congenital they this mm. was something that was wrong with this child at birth but mm. the child was perfectly healthy up yeah. till the day of vaccines yeah so yeah. it is very hard to think of any other cause apart mm. from the vaccine yeah so uh, like people like me uh, my my friends etc so all all they uh, have all they uh, have uh, vaccinated Uh, have been vaccinated and uh, what happens is that uh, when we see ourselves there are no symptoms i am not autistic i am not adhd so they th- so they say that uh, there might be only 0.1% uh, chance or maybe lesser than that but that does not mean that i will not vaccinate myself uh, maybe vaccinations might help so uh, what argument should i well, maybe is maybe is not good enough yeah maybe if you're if you're taking a vaccine because maybe it will help hmm. then you're an idiot I'm yeah, sorry. That, that is not a thoughtful person. Yeah. You need to ask, okay, you want to vaccinate me against yellow fever. Mm. So I want to see the peer-reviewed, double-blinded, randomized trial mm. using a true placebo that mm. showed that the risk of yellow fever was lower after vaccination. 
You yes. will not find that trial. Mm. You will find doctors saying, well, we developed antibodies. Mm. Well, that's not good enough. Mm. That is not scientific proof. If yes. you need scientific proof to show that there's a connection between vaccines and autism, and no matter what I produce, you will say, well, that's not proof. That's mm. not proof. Mm. Well, I'm going to say the same thing about vaccines. Mm. You haven't proven that this vaccine prevents polio mm. or yellow fever or diphtheria mm. or yeah. whooping cough or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think people are being biased if they insist on an absurd level of proof on things that go against the medical establishment. Yes. And they accept the word of the medical establishment on things where there clearly is not proof. Yes. That, yes. that is not a rational human being. If yes. we want to think that we live in a scientific society, mm. we as individuals have to apply some scientific logic and we have to challenge the doctors who are not quoting sources, as you've pointed out, mm. but are just saying, everybody knows that the polio vaccine eliminated polio. Yes, well, sir. everybody thinks that, but it might not be true. Yeah. And sir, what will be your perspective on uh, the plagues? Uh, that happened uh, during the, the bubonic plague that happened and the plagues that happened in India in, in the 18th century, etc. So according to the germ theory and uh, uh, the Terran theory, what, uh, what will be the explanation of the plagues? Well, the only plague that I've really studied is the 1630 plague in Milan. And it yeah. is unusually well documented. Mm. And there is nothing in the documentation uh, that convinces me that it was not a nutritional plague. Mm. It was a time of war. Mm. Uh, the, the government was run by the, the King of Spain mm. and food was being shipped from Italy where people were starving mm. to Spain. Mm. Uh, in Italy, the, the lowest form of food is polenta, which is made from maize. Mm. Maize is vitamin B deficient. Mm. A disease called pelagra, mm. pelagra, is another Italian word which means rotten skin. Yes. So in these plagues, people mm. had skin problems that were probably vitamin B deficiencies. Okay. And of course, it looked like a plague because mm. at the same time, large numbers of people were coming out with the same symptoms. But yes. large numbers yes. of people were not getting an adequate diet. Yeah. Large numbers of people were, were subsisting on a porridge made from maize mm. um, for too long. So it looked infectious, but it wasn't. Mm. So I don't believe that there's proof that the plagues were infectious. Just because yeah. a lot of people got sick at the same time does not prove it's infectious. Mm. Sir, uh, so my question uh, on, I have a question on sanitation. So everybody is saying that we should have uh, sanitations and uh, sanitations uh, uh, reduce the risk of uh, contacting uh, diseases. So when we do sanitations, I, I know sanitation is very essential. It, it looks good also and it protects us also. But uh, what, what are your comments on the chemicals used in the sanitation process? Uh, on the daily basis, uh, not only for COVID, but for in any situation? Will they cause harm, sir? Well, I, I think a certain level of cleanliness is, is important. I mean, I think if you, if you uh, are in contact um, with a lot of things that aren't, are, you know, with water that's not clean and with foods that's, that's not clean, then yes, you can, you can get sick. Mm. But what we're at now is a, is a situation where it's taken to an extreme. Mm. If everything is wiped down with toxic chemicals mm. before you can put food on it, yeah. then our food is getting toxic chemicals. Yes. Even if I go to an organic store, mm. they are using toxic chemicals that would not be allowed in the food mm. to wipe down the counter. So my food, which is organic, is now contaminated with the chemicals before I leave the shop. Mm. So we've gone to the other extreme. Mm. I think in the in the 20th century, 19th and 20th century, the development of sanitation, like indoor toilets and running water and mm. um, you know, chlorinated water, those were good things, but mm. we are now gone way to the opposite extreme and the coronavirus mm. has, has made this a very dangerous development. Uh, yes. I think it's gonna make a lot of people sick. 
Yes. So one more thing I get confused about is that uh, uh, what is the sanitation protecting us against if according to the uh, terrain theory, we think that uh, particles are not contagious. So what is the sanitation protecting us against? Is the bacteria well, producing? Uh, I think it's, it's clear that there are parasites in water that's not treated mm. and, and those can make you sick. Mm. Uh, now, maybe you're more likely to get sick if you're already your body is weak. So mm. if you're an 80 year old um, with, a, with poor kidneys, then it's much mm. more likely to do you harm. But mm. that doesn't mean that if you, if you drink water contaminated with parasites, you're not gonna get sick. Mm. So we do need some level of sanitation. Mm. I, I think that's clear. Okay, so but, the um, huh. once you get to the, the, the point where the water has no bacteria and it has no parasites, um, I think we've gone far enough. Mm. And, you know, our, our bodies, you know, if we eat, um, you know, vegetables, there are probably mm. bacteria on those vegetables and our body can deal with that. Yes. Now, if, if the vegetables were grown in human manure and they were not washed properly, mm. we might get sick. Yes. But yes. given that the vegetables are washed and um, that the, if there's any manure that it's been allowed to age enough so that it's mm. not like got large quantities of bacteria. Mm. I, I think our bodies can deal with mm. a certain amount of bacteria and it only strengthens our immune system. Yes. If our immune system is not challenged, it's like our muscles. Mm. If we avoid using our muscles, mm. then our muscles will get weak. And yes. it's the same with the immune system. Yes, absolutely, sir. So uh, lastly, I would like to, you know, uh, give you some comments on the modern medicine system because I, I have heard some uh, strange uh, reports during uh, this search, some strange report during, during this COVID crisis that uh, the mortality rate uh, decreases when doctors go on strike. So uh, I have heard a couple of journal articles which have said that the mortality rate goes down when doctors go on strike. So is, is it true that uh, when a uh, human being naturally, uh, if he's not given modern medical treatment, uh, the death rate will go down in some cases? Uh, yes, I, I think that is true. The doctor's mm -hmm. strikes are uh, re associated with a reduction in mortality. I think there is a large amount of over-treatment uh, that occurs, mm. um, especially, uh, I mean, in any, in any medical system, the medical system is funded by procedures. Mm. The more procedures they do, the more money they make. Yes. So it is always a temptation to encourage people to have medical treatment that they don't need. Mm. Uh, so I definitely think that's a problem. The problem is that there are times when people do need the hospital, mm. you know, people who've been in an accident, who've been physically injured, Mm. need the hospital. And, and during this coronavirus um, problem, for example, people who needed physiotherapy that was being given at a hospital, the things like that were not, were not getting it. But um, in many cases, cancer therapy just hastens death. Mm. And so the inability to get cancer therapy might not, in the end, uh, increase mm. uh, the death rate. Yes. So, so it's it's hard to say. I guess we will we will see this later. What mm. the statistics say? Yeah, I also recognize the emergence, uh, the pros of medical treatment in emergency situations. But uh, the the treatment of infectious disease is very strange, very very strange. Uh, mm -hmm. that they use antibiotics because antibiotics is for uh, bacteria and they are using it for viruses. So it seems very strange and they're like experimental treatment. It's true. Almost everybody who had coronavirus who died had been given antibiotics. Yes. Sir. Why were they giving antibiotics when they believed that it was a viral pneumonia? Yeah. And sir, is there a link between the current food that we eat, the you know hybrid food that we are eating, genetically modified food and the medical conditions that are arising? Or is there any partnership between these uh, organizations like Monsanto and the uh, Big Pharma? Is there any partnership, sir? Well, there's, there's a lot of connections. I'm, I'm not an expert on GMO crops. Mm. Personally, if I have a choice, I would not eat GMO food. Yeah. Um, I think there's a good chance it's less nutritious. Mm. I, I'm not uh, on the extreme end of, of saying that it's it's going to cause a severe illness. 
Hmm. But it, it, it's it's part of the uh, companies that produce seed hmm. and pesticides are working together to ensure that farmers are locked into their system. Hmm. So really the big victims of GMO are the farmers. They're hmm. persuaded to buy GMO seeds hmm. and now they have to buy pesticides from um, the the same manufacturer and they mm. have to go back every year to buy seeds. So the old business of saving some seed and then planting it next year, that can't happen with GMO crops. Mm. And this has been the aim of, of uh, agricultural companies for a century is to make sure that the farmers have to spend money on seed yes. every year. That's what the scam is. Yes, I have particularly observed this, sir. And uh, um, lastly, I would like to say that, uh, you know, like concluding our talk, that this uh, pandemic that happened, uh, it, it, it is not an intentional pandemic. Some people might have involved in it, but uh, it is uh, not intentional, right? I, I don't believe that it's intentional. Mm. I think there's arrogance of public health officials who felt that they could destroy a pandemic mm. based on what they'd read in textbooks. They'd read lies in textbooks when they were in university and they believed those lies. And they said, now we have the chance to prove that this works. Mm. And what they proved is it doesn't work. And for more information, I would encourage people to go to, go to theinfectiousmyth.com. You can read a lot that I've written and other people have written about um, the the false pandemic yeah and uh, I, I encourage people to read and think and do their own research yeah and like uh, common citizens like us how will we communicate to the government that uh, this pandemic theory that you're proposing is wrong how 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 can we approach people uh, have you approached the government in canada sir uh, i have not approached uh, too many people in the government directly because the people in the government in Canada are so fervently in in uh, in belief of this mm. pandemic. Mm. In my city, I did uh, challenge the mayor related mm. to masks, mm. and um, one of his assistants uh, tried to get me to shut up. Mm. And so I felt that the mayor, who was elected by a democratic vote, Mm. no longer represented the people of Calgary. His, he reported only to public health officials and he didn't care what citizens said. In fact, well, he does care what citizens say. If any citizen says something that disagrees with the public health official, it is mm. his job to silence that citizen. Absolutely. And, and, and this, is, this angers me greatly. Um, this is not a man who... Uh, this is a man I voted for every time he ran, mm. and and I'm now extremely angry because he is no longer representing the citizens of my city. And I think this is true around the world. Mm. The politicians have forgotten that they were elected, and that they are elect they are representing unelected public health officials. Yes, and sir, what will you comment on the uh, YouTube videos that are getting censored? Because it seems very intentional, and uh, it is very strange that okay, uh, if the medical information is misleading, I can accept that. But people are getting personal attacks. Uh, so uh, I heard that uh, you might have heard that uh, Brian Rose from London Real, his TED talk has been deleted, which was filmed in 2011, and other couple of doctors uh, I have heard that in India, Bishwaru Prai Chaudhary. Uh, his diet video, which was not even related to COVID-19, got deleted. So, uh, like, is it intentional or is it some bots that are deleting? It's, it's intentional. I mean, these, these social media companies have said, I think mm. it was Twitter that said, or maybe it was YouTube, that if mm. the information goes against the World Health Organization, it will be deleted. Mm. Now, there's so much stuff on, these, on the social media that it's, it's not heavily affected. Like in terms of the videos, the interviews of me, I only know of one that's been censored and I've probably done 20 different interviews. Mm. Um, so the censorship is not very effective, but it is, it is deliberate and it is an attempt to shut everybody up. It's now very common on Facebook to, to see, uh, you know, a message saying, 
this information is fake news. Mm. And you can still see it. You can press a button to see it. But that discourages some people. But on the other hand, I think it makes other people say, Facebook is censoring. And I'm going to click on that button to see what I want it to see. And I, I'm going to increasingly ignore Facebook. And if Facebook blocks me from seeing what I want to see, I will have to find another social network. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we can live without Facebook. Absolutely, sir. And uh, me, uh, when I was like researching this stuff, you know, uh, it is it is very disheartening, sir, because people uh, call us germ theory denialists and anti-vacciners and like conspiracy theorists. And every day you uh, have a great cognitive dissonance in your head that if if the government might be true, what is true? So it was like very stressful for uh, these two months was very stressful for me. And like people who know me, uh, uh, like uh, one of my sisters, uh, 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 she's a doctor so she she was trying to tell me that uh, i see patients every day and uh, there are a lot of patients coming in our hospital and you are spreading misinformation please stop this so it was very hard for, hard for me sir to you know face this two months and uh, i uh, for that, I would like to ask you a personal question that how do you, uh, uh, I don't know which field you are working in right now, but how do you keep yourself motivated in investigating in all these things? Because uh, nobody is, you know, not a large number of people are listening to you like the mainstream doctor. So how do you, do you keep yourself motivated and doing this research without any external motivation, sir? Well, there are a large number of people listening to me. It's not a mm. large percentage. Mm. <clears throat> And, but I think the number of people who are listening is greater. Mm. And I'm happy that there are other people saying things that are similar to me. There is a great deal of resistance to, to the lockdown. Mm. Even doctors who are pretty mainstream in their beliefs are pointing out that the death rate was exaggerated and uh, that the adverse consequences of the uh, lockdown were not mm. considered. Mm. Um, I, I just think this is important and, and it's, it's my role to bring this forward. Nobody mm. else is doing this or not enough people are, are taking it to mm. the level that I'm taking it, mm. it to. And I've done a tremendous amount of research. I have a huge volume of documents on a number of different diseases and I need to pursue this to completion. So yes. I don't need... Um, you know, millions of people telling me that I'm the great guru of infectious diseases. I'm going to do what I think is right. And uh, I'm heartened that more and more people are listening to me and they're writing to me and telling me that this has completely changed their view of the world. <clears throat> and uh, people are doing their own research. And sometimes mm. people are coming back to me with information mm. that is useful. Yeah. Um, so it is, it is really a team effort. And um, we are making progress. Slowly, yes. we're making progress. Yeah, sir, I uh, really salute your work because I have seen those documents that the, you, have, you have given every source, you have quoted every source and they are very scientific. I have never seen those kind of things from the mainstream doctors. So uh, I, lastly, I would like to thank you so much for you know giving me time for your interview. I know you are busy in your research and other work. And uh, I will definitely recommend my audience to check the infectiousmeet.com podcast. And prior to this COVID-19 also, you were doing the podcast and uh, I watched the earlier episodes and they were excellent, sir. So definitely I recommend uh, everyone checking uh, documents that are the antibody test document, the flaws in the pandemic theory document to my viewers. And uh, again, from all the uh, all my friends who were requesting the interview, they were also they would like to also say you thank you personally. Thank you. And uh, also uh, my parents are also very impressed by your work and also thank you from their side. And thank you for giving well, your thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to address an audience in in India. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your part in, in bringing this information to a very large and important country. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I will uh, get in touch if, uh, uh, if some questions need to be answered in the future. Sure. Yeah, Please thanks. just send me questions. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank and you, sir. Uh, have a good evening. Yes, yeah, sir. And uh, would you like to give any concluding comments regarding this pandemic? I, I think we've, we've discussed lots of things. So mm. go to my website, theinfectiousmyth.com. Some documents are short and easy to read. Some are mm. longer. Mm. Um, read, think, do your own research. 
send me a question. If you think there's, there's a problem with my theories, uh, send me a question and I'll, I'll do my best to try to answer it. I can't, I can't answer every question, but I'll try. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. And where can people find you, sir, uh, other than the infectiousmate.com? Well, that's, that's the main place, and that has my podcast. It has my email address. So mm. through that one place, you can find everything. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. And uh, if any other questions come up, I'll definitely contact you.